Welcome to the first uh, webinar of um, 2021 for FieldCom Group. This is a members webinar, only members only webinar, and it's focused on, on FDI development uh, processes. From the introductory video that we sent out a couple of weeks ago, I think you know that this series of webinars is primarily going to be focused on things that engineers need to do to get their FDI device packages through registration. And this first one in this series is going to be about implementing condensed health device site status in in conjunction with any 107 and also some best practices for tax for doing attachments and including attachments in an FDI device package. I think you all know that FDI device packages will be required in registration later this year and this <clears throat> this series is designed to help prep you in that in in that endeavor for that uh, for that requirement. So a few rules of order here unless expressly stated webinars are for field com group members only. There's a control panel in, in on your go to on your go to webinar panel that has allows you to ask questions. Please ask those questions in the panel, and we will uh, answer them either as they come up or afterwards after we're done with the presentation. And then the other thing is uh, it's better it's best to use either computer audio or headsets. It sounds better, and you can go to FCG TV for more webinars. So with that, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists for today. Um, it's going to be Heather Wilden and Wally Pratt, who are going to be walking through the balance of this presentation. And at this moment, I'm going to step aside and let them um, turn the show over to them. Thank you. All right. Good morning. My name is Heather Wilden. I'm the product manager here at Philcom Group. Uh, I'll be doing the second part of this presentation about attachments. Um, I'll be around to ask, answer questions towards the end. And we also have Wally here with us. Wally, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Wally Pratt, and I've been uh, working with Philcom Group since the Earth was cooling. And I'm probably best known for the work I've done with Hart over the years. And, you know, it was uh, interesting to go back and actually edit a DD for the first time in probably 10 years. And I mean, sure, if you can do this, this is really not that hard once you keep some of the points in mind that I'll share with you this morning. So getting started, started, I'd like to provide a brief overview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how status and diagnostics and smart field devices have evolved, where it's come from, uh, how you know, the more any 107 has influenced industry to think about how you can manage the amount of status that's available in smart field devices then we'll go in through in some detail how you add this to your dd uh, how you build it and integrate it into your fdi device package and we'll show this then running with a real field device uh, in fact a field device that you can set up yourself if you're interested and then heather i'll give it back over to heather to talk about uh, the attachments and how you can put manuals documentation data sheets and other useful stuff into your package uh, everything we're doing here today is to benefit the end users, uh, and there are some real benefits, I think, for those users. First, we're going to provide a brief overview of kind of the history of where status and diagnostics, where we came from, kind of where we're going. You know, I've been around since, uh, really since DDs became introduced back in about 1994. And smart devices, with its harder FF, have got a lot of status information that's been put in there. Uh, this has been really beneficial. I mean, there's potentially over 200 status bits in Heart Command 48 and over 128 in uh, Foundation Field Bus devices. These have really been good for the users because it allows them to do a deep dive into what's going on with the device and help to reduce their maintenance costs quite a bit. But there's so much status in some devices that it kind of, if you talk about it and said technicians start thinking about it as the plant operators, it's hard to tell what to pay attention to. When you have a plant that has hundreds of field devices, 
uh, there's a lot going on and this can cause operators to kind of their eyes glaze over so to speak because there's really in some ways too much information uh, during plant critical plant trips and stuff like that alarm floods have become kind of famous and so one of the real questions here is you know how do you manage this how do you triage and sort out what's the most important thing to pay attention to so these have been real good benefits but you know we need to do better the Nemour condensed status was introduced as a way to reduce a, a, a large number of status information down to you know simple uh, traffic light if you will uh, they categorize things as devices in good condition or it needs maintenance uh, whether some measurements are out of spec due to process conditions uh, whether somebody's working on a device where the device has failed I mean, the idea here is to provide a real simple way for all the devices on their you know up on their uh, plant screens to know which ones they should be paying attention to uh, and of course only one of these lights are indicated at a time the real key here that i want to present with you is that if you do these things were suggested for dd you and your dd and the fdi tools can make the life of the plant operator a lot better. I mean, you're really working together on this. And so we're gonna talk very specifically about how to make the plant operator's life better using Get Health Status. So to support this, we're gonna add a Get Health Status method to an existing DD. We're gonna have an uh, array of uh, diagnostic strings that can be displayed to provide specific direction to users as to what to do. And we're gonna use the samples that are in the FDI Heart uh, standard DDs coming out in FDI version 1.5. In effect, if you do these things, the FDI host will display for you what the basic health of your device is. And what we're doing today works with all versions of Heart 5, 6, or 7 devices, and it works with FFH1 devices, although the samples we're work, looking with at today are really from the Heart uh, perspective. So we're gonna go now through the specifics of how you add this status to your DD. Um, so we're gonna go into some detail review exactly how FDI and your DD work together. We're going to talk about Heart 7 sample DDL and how we can take and cut and paste the Get Health status method infrastructure and put into your DD. The steps to make it so that this actually works, it's really simple. You add some status masks to the Get Health status method, uh, update these status masks, and then you run it, uh, build and run it with an FDI package IDE. And so you get your new DD here. The EDD and the FDI host work together on this. The FDI host periodically call the get health status method. The return value from that indicates the overall health of the device. You know, the highest priority of course is failure. So the return code is a five. These return codes are in both the sample DD as well in the FDI specs. The device health diagnostics array uh, is a way to provide specific strings to the user to give them direction on what they should be doing to address whatever the current health condition is of the device. We're using again the Sample Heart 7 DDL as a guide. Uh, this does not include the condensed health status commands. Um, this, as a result, this works for all versions of the Heart protocol. So this is pretty straightforward to add no matter what your DD is, you don't have to do a device revision to take advantage of this. You can take advantage of this simply with a DD revision. We're going to specifically look at how we add health status to the Heart IP Developer Kit. Heart IP Developer Kit is an open source project on GitHub. Uh, the DDs for it come with the purchase of the Developer Kit. We're going to take the code from the Sample Heart 7 DD. 
and cut and paste it into the native flow DD. Of course, then we'll bump the revision of the native flow and then save it as a new source code, native flow.r2 DDL. The main thing we have to do is update a few status masks, the native flow device that is in this Raspberry Pi has only one device specific status byte. So there's actually only like four lines of code you got to change in the uh, get health status method to make this work. While we're at it, we're going to take an opportunity to review all the status strings we have in command 48, improve them, add help as necessary, and then uh, move on from there. This is kind of a directory of um, the contents of the get health status method. The get health status is about 400 lines of code. It runs from lines 1363 to 796. If you can take and cut and paste those in there, uh, that uh, is all you really need. Uh, there's a number of other infrastructure things. These generally don't need to be uh, addressed. Next slide, please. Really, all we're going to need to do and all you need to do in most cases is just look at these few set snippets of code and add the masks for your device specific status. So it's actually not very difficult at all. In general, the process is we're going to go through and identify which status bits are important to uh, device health. Uh, some status bits may not be something important to device health, and so they won't affect the return codes. We'll then take those bits and categorize them as failure or function check or maintenance or what have you. We'll take and then create the masks that are used by the method. Once that's done, we'll review our command 48 status bits, uh, this being a heart device, and improve those, add help if we want need to, or you know, this is a good opportunity to review what you have in command 48. Um, and then we'll test and register the device. The key part is really identifying what is diagnostic conditions and what is just kind of you know notifications. So you look at all of them and you say, well, you know, some of these status you have in your device are important, but they don't mean the device has failed. So those won't be maxed in at all. But the diagnostics will take and map then to the appropriate conditions. So again, the conditions that we're looking at is, is this status bit indicate the device has failed? Or does it indicate it's out of spec? Or does it, you know, um, you know, have no effect, the device is good. And what we're going to do and then in the masks is we'll go, go through the device specific masks. And there's one for failure, function check, maintenance, um, and out of spec and modify those masks accordingly. So in our case, the hard IP flow device only has a single status byte. So for failures, we're going to only need to update this one specific failure mask and determine what bits that are in that device specific status means that there's been a failure in the device. Okay. Let's start with something everybody should be aware of. Standardized status is a number of different is one of many status bytes that are in the common table specifications. For all the standardized status, for the extended device status, for the device status itself, we have added the codes or identified which ones affect what device health status level. So uh, as you can see here in the yellow highlighted, F is for failure, C is for function, check it, what, and so forth. And then of course, N is no effect. So let's look at N in particular. It's important for people to know whether the device configuration is locked or not, but that doesn't really affect device health. Whereas, you know, if the non-volatile memory has failed in the field device, that means the device is pretty sick. That means you need to replace the device. Next slide, please. So looking at this, we're taking and math these into the different 
uh, no more status levels. And as you can see, there's a number of these in the standardized status that are failures. Thus, we come up with 4E for failures, you know, oring together all the bits to create the mask, and do similar things for the other no more conditions. Now, looking at the heart. So if you look at how that results in the mask inside the get health status method, that means the standardized status index is set to 4E. We're going to do the similar thing for the device specific status. So this is the device specific status for the Raspberry Pi Flow device that's in the Heart IP developer kit. There is a data sheet, you know, your standard field device data sheet that's required as part of your registration out on GitHub. So this is little screenshot here is directly from that uh, that slide, that page in GitHub. And what we've done is we've looked at all these different conditions and identified which ones affect the device health. So for example, if we've lo lost the drive current to the flow tube on the Coriolis meter, that usually means there's a broken wire or a bad amplifier, so that's a failure condition. Likewise, most flow devices I've worked with historically, may not be true with Coriolis, but I've worked with a lot of different flow meters over, over my life. Uh, they generally have only a 10 to one turndown. So the max flow rate for the Raspberry Pi is 24,000 kilograms per hour. And so if the turndown, if the flow rate is less than 2,400, below the 10 to one turndown, then we're gonna tell people that we're probably out of spec that measurement may not be so good anymore. The result is we go in and change the mask in our source code to enter a 90 to indicate the failure status. And we've changed three other lines. There's a mask for, um, condensed for function check, one for device needs maintenance, and one for out of spec. And so we basically modified those four lines in the sample code, and we're basically pretty much done. The meat of the method is a loop, and the loop goes through there and look at each byte returning command 48, applies all the different masks to it, and then determines what is the highest priority uh, return value, and this generates the return value. You don't have to modify this method at all. Once you've modified the masks, then this just works. And so there's conditionals like this elsewhere. While we're at it, we took an opportunity to look at the device specific status zero that was in the DD that we produced and distributed to people who bought the Hard IP developer kit last year uh, and updated to add help because there was no help indicated uh, in that example DD. And so I took this opportunity to. Uh, to improve the DD and it's a good chance. It's funny as you look at code that you maybe you wrote 10 years ago and you look at it and you go, what the hell was I thinking, right? And so this is a good opportunity to go back and look at that and make some improvements. So this is the DD sitting inside the, um, inside the uh, FDI package IDE. Uh, we're gonna take and uh, compile this and generate it, and then we're going to run it on the FDI uh, package IDE RRTE. And then when you run the RRTE, the RRTE doesn't automatically pull the health, so we actually have to click on the health button to, to um, actually execute this. And then we can look at the actual diagnostic screens and see the command 48 bits. And so what we're gonna do then next is we'll take and actually run this and show you some slides of what this looks like. So let's begin. So what we have here is, the first thing is you have to set it up so it's using the hard IP configuration server, communication server. And it also has to be a hard FSK 
profile. And with these two set up, we can start talking to the Raspberry Pi flow device. As you can see, our initial conditions, the diagnostics are all clear. Life's good, the field device is healthy. Uh, clicking to operate, you see a trend. The trend shows the flow rate and it shows the drive current. Flow rate's in blue, the drive current is in green. And we're gonna manipulate this. So here is our field device, our Raspberry Pi. We're gonna go over here and we're gonna adjust the trim pot on there to change the flow rate. And there is also an optocoupler on there that affects the drive current. You can see the flow rate is decreasing. It's now below the 2400 kilograms per hour rate. And so if we go over and click on the health, you can see then the health will be out of spec. Okay. You can see the flow rate's all the way down to about nine kilograms per hour. Click on the health, it's out of spec. You click on the diagnostic and you see, hey, the low flow is detected, which means the flow rate's low enough to not be very accurate. And you can, therefore, and that's really all that's going on here. But this is a clear example of how you can even indicate uh, the health is reduced. So going back to operate, you can see the flow rate is still pretty low. Uh, we're then going to take and go back over to our Raspberry Pi device and adjust the pot so the flow rate comes back up. And again, this is uh, all on GitHub except for the DDs and some additional documentation that's a value add here. You can see the flow rate come back up. Actually, you can actually also see Heather's covering up the optocoupler a little bit and so even the drive current's changing. You see all the health status is back to normal. Life's good, the uh, uh, flow rate and drive current have stabilized. Next, we're going to do the same thing. Next, we're going to do similar things to diagnose issues with the, um, with the drive current. We're going to cover up the optocoupler. When it does, the drive current is going to go quite high. That generally indicates that the health of the device is compromised, you need to do maintenance. The idea here is that that field device simulates that as the drive current goes high, that probably means the flow tube is becoming plugged and you need to go clean it out. And that's a maintenance activity. So you can see maintenance is required, high drive current, and the health indicates that you need to do maintenance on the field device. Back in the operate mode, you can see that the, the drive current is quite high, 127 milliamps. Uh, the health is also then uh, indicated here. Now next, we'll take and magically take our hands off the optocoupler. The drive current will come back down to normal conditions. And then we can click on the health status. Life's good in the field device now. And all the status is back to normal operating conditions. So actually, it's kind of cool. I mean, it just kind of works, you know. And then the next one we're going to do is we're going to simulate a zero drive current. We do this by putting more light onto the optocoupler. When there is no drive current, that usually means like a wire's broke or the you know, driver has gone bad, the op amplifier has gone bad. So that's a device failure. And you can see the health indicates it's failure that you got, uh, not only the device needs maintenance, but you got a lot of problems going on here. And you can see there's quite a few status indicators lit up. <clears throat> and of course, then we can go back to the operate mode. Uh, you can see the current is now, uh, we're going to take that, that uh, cover off of that optocoupler and the uh, life goes back to normal operation. So pretty good stuff. I think, uh, yeah, let's talk and briefly, I've gone through quite a bit here. Uh, don't be too challenging here. Of course, you get the slides. Uh, what I really wanna talk about now is kind of a summary here. 
if you've got a registered DDs, and I think most people are registering their DDs today, although I think there may be a few that aren't, you know, this is a good thing. It's a good thing because you have a DD that has all the status, it's very clear. The instrument techs have an easy way to uh, work on their field device and trouble to shoot their field devices. So this is good, but it can be a little overwhelming. And so the really what I propose is a better solution is that the FDI package IDE uh, updating it to include the get health status method is a great value add for your end user. It's prioritized so that the most important conditions are eliminated. Uh, the status is based upon the more conditions, those five symbols. You know, you get a green light if everything's good. Uh, you get an indication if the need maintenance on the device. You know, all this is built into FDI. You should take advantage of it. Uh, the diagnostic message can be generated using the help strings. And this works whether you have condensed status commands or not. It works whether you're a Heart 5, 6, or 7 device. I would propose to you that if you're still selling a Heart 5 device, this is a great value add to update that so it has a device package and for you to take care of what Nomura is expecting and industry as a whole is expecting for health status information. Of course, the best solution is to implement the condensed status commands because now you don't need a DD or a device package, a controller or a programmable or a PLC can actually give this summary status information to the, uh, to the end user, even if you don't have a DD. So the best solution is to do the, to implement the commands and do the full thing, but improving the device packages to include this uh, health information is really a great first step. And as a reminder, FDI device packages are going to be required for new devices toward the end of this year. So uh, you need to start thinking about this anyway, especially if you're doing a new device. The timeline is up on uh, our website. And the uh, get health status method is an important part that is mandatory. I mean, we've got 100 people working in the integration working group. So this is just not me and Heather saying this. I mean, the members have worked together in these working groups and decided that this is really important stuff. And, you know, I think this is a great value add to our membership and to the end users. Uh, thank you. I think I'll turn this back over to Heather now. Yeah, thanks, Wally. It's really good uh, explanation of what people need to do to add content status. Uh, the last section today is going to be all about the attachments that you put in your FDI package. These are um, files that you include with the FDI package for the benefit of the end user. So these would be things like uh, ways to identify your device, how to commission your device, you can add product images, uh, there are specific sizes and only a PhD PNG format is uh, currently supported by FDI to keep everyone standardized. Um, and there's also protocol specific files depending on what protocol the device is. Um, so CFF if it's a uh, H1 device, for instance. Uh, get info files if it's a part device. That's also something you'll find in the attachments section of your uh, of your package. So what we suggest is uh, to include some important information uh, in your attachments. Uh, these would be things like user manuals, proof of registration, other certifications for SIL, a quick start guide for your users, part list or warranty information. Uh, the FDI registration process will provide you with an official FDI registration diploma to include in your attachments. So if you've already been through this process once, you'll know what that looks like. Um, it's a simple PDF file and explains, you know, what date this file was registered, what version of the device, what version of the package. Um, so it's a human readable information of the registration process that the file went through. Things that you may not want to include uh, would be documents that will become obsolete in a short amount of time. 
since devices are installed and operating for over 10 years at a time. Um, you cannot include other EDDs for this device. There's only one DD for one package, and it's for one device. Um, and the FDA IDE includes tools to help you with your implementations to conform to the FDI specifications. So don't forget about that, uh, including the file types of your attachment. Uh, so there's actually two tools in there you can use to test your uh, FDI package before you send it to us for test and registration. Uh, there's DPCTT or the device package conformance test tool, as well as the reference runtime engine, uh, which is what you saw in our little demonstration here today. Th these two tools can help you uh, test out your product before you send it into our labs. So once you've decided to include attachments in your FDI package, there's a couple of things to consider. The file name should be easily identifiable to end users. This might not always be feasible if your company abides by corporate standards for naming conventions uh, for your product documentation. I'm showing one example here that has four PDFs with very similar file names, but none of these names correlate to the actual model name of this device. So supporting multiple languages is advantageous, uh, but not a requirement of FDI. So we do support multiple languages. Uh, this is a decision for you and your product team to make. And note that not all host applications will show attachments in the same way. In this example on the right here, we have the reference runtime engine. This allows the user to open up a menu and view the information about the package and its attachments. If there's any UIPs, you'll see that in a, a tab here as well. Let's look at another example. This example is uh, an expandable tab called documentation. I'll blow it up here so you can see a little better here. So in this documentation tab, the end user can see uh, the different file names here. And you'll see a manual, a quick start guide, a product data sheet, as well as device info files, which are the XML and JSON file types. Once you've found the package attachments, how do you know the purpose of each of these items found in this interface if the file names are not so intuitive? That's where metadata can help. So what is metadata in an FDI package context? Metadata is provided in an XML schema and describes the properties of a resource. A resource is anything that has an identity. For an FDI device package attachment, this is limited to our documents, images, and protocol files that I just described. We're using the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative uh, to help define these metadata element structures. And you can use that um, DM, DCMI to extend the uh, metadata about the other attachments in your files. So how, how is this going to be implemented? Well, the FDI specifications version 1.3 that are out for ballot right now um, includes the definition of a new XML schema file. This is the FDI package documentation catalog schema. The main catalog XML will include reference to this documentation catalog XML. And in the upcoming FDI IDE 1.5 release, um, there'll be a way to add this metadata to your attachments as you're building up your package. So a quick summary about what we've learned today, and we're about to jump into our Q&A section. Um, so FDI requires a health status indication in every device package. Existing heart devices can leverage Command 48 data to fulfill no more any 107 diagnostic status reporting. And all device packages need to include useful documents about the product for end users and have it easily accessible. So the next release of the FDI developer tools will include a helpful library of macros and standardized code uh, you can pull into your files uh, to quickly develop your heart 
FDI device packages. And we look forward to adding metadata for documents contained in the package attachments. So that's the presentation for today. Um, I want to thank Wally for uh, being here today and doing an awesome job with the kid and status. My pleasure. And Paul, yep. you here. do you want to go through some questions we've got? Yeah, I'm going to go through some. I can go through some of them. I've been answering them fast and furiously while you guys have been talking. Um, great job, by the way. Um, so we have about 117 people on this call, which I'm really thrilled with. I think that might be our record. It's really great that everybody kind of set, set in here. Um, I've asked a bunch, answered a bunch of questions online already. Uh, we had some questions about Modbus. We had some questions about, um, you know, about the, the FDI IDE, frankly. Um, and we had some questions about, about training. We did just announce that there's a new training course that's open for uh, an online EDD registration course, uh, EDD training course that will be conducted in a couple of months. Maybe somebody can dig up the link and send it to me on Slack and I'll post it into this chat box here if you want to register for that. And please enter in more questions if you have them. I'm going to go through some that have not yet been answered and uh, see what we can see if we can an answer them or pass it over to some people. OK, is it possible to get these slides? The um, entire presentation and the video will be posted. I don't see any reason not to supply the slides, Heather, do you? No, I can I can get that prepared for when we publish it on our uh, our YouTube channel. Okay, sounds good. Um, and this will be published on the on, on our YouTube channel as um, as as Heather mentioned. I've um, got a question. So there's one question that if somebody wants to know if there's any um, if there's any way to learn. Uh, the stuff before our next training class. Absolutely. Why don't you reach out to just file a support ticket on the support system, um, and we can help guide you through. Uh, we can help guide you through something. Okay. Uh, can the FDI package attachments be updated without updating the FDI revision? How to manage revisions where manuals, documents may need to be updated? Okay. This is a question for Heather. I think you might know the answer to this. Um, so the, the question is, can the FDI package attachments be updated without updating the FDI revision? How to manage revisions where manuals, documents may need to be updated? I think this has something to do with um, security and signing and things like that. Um, it, it will. Um, we are looking to revise our FDI device package registration policy and procedures. Um, so we have found uh, a related thing to this is um, someone wanted to apply a, a newer, more robust signature to their package. Um, this may fall into a similar category where you're not touching the EDD, which is the part that we test um, uh, stringently. The attachments are there for the aid of the end users. So uh, we are currently working on updating our policies and documentation around that. So. Um, if you want more information, if you want to um, learn more in advance of us publishing the updates, uh, feel free to reach out with a support ticket and we'll provide you with what our plans are. Um, so that's that's coming. Uh, look for that when, uh, when it gets updated. Uh, I think it's certainly important to note that attachments have been part of the FDI packages since, the Earth, since it was introduced. So... Yeah. I mean, all versions of FDI supports attachments. Uh, what we're really trying to do is we've seen you really kind of a diversity the way people have done these attachments is a kind of confusing. So what we're trying to do here is provide some guidance to make it, you know, urge you to include attachments, but also do it in a in a way that's sane and people can figure out what the attachment is. Some people have some really unique names for some of their attachments that no human probably can figure out. And so, you know, updating the attachments is pretty easy. It's been supported by all versions of FDI. Uh, of course, the package 
version would change because anytime you modify it would change and the signatures would change and all that stuff. But they've been supported since the get go, since day one. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's pretty easy change. To, 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 to do a registration on something as simple as just a device, a document revision change. Um, so, Wally, here's a question right up your alley. Is it mandatory to use Command 48 for the status bits mapping? Well, no, technically it's not. Um, I do know that there are some devices that didn't put all their status in Command 48, and you know that makes it harder for a host that's not a DD host. Uh, but strictly speaking, the get, get health uh, status method doesn't really care. You will have to go in and actually do a lot more work when you do that. Because the way the sample method is set up is it only walks through the status in command 48, but technically you can get the status from wherever you want. So the short answer to the question, as far as I'm concerned, is that you don't have to use it, but if you want to use the stuff that we taught you in this webinar, you should. <laughs> uh, correct. And from a protocol standpoint, we frown on people doing status in places that users don't normally look. Yeah. Okay, we've got a lot of questions coming in here. How can I attend the EDD development course? I'm trying to dig up the the link, um, and if I can get it, I will post it into this chat into this chat into this chat message for registration. Um, okay, hold on a second here. Irina has posted it, um, and I'll, I'll post it in the chat. Right yeah. There. Okay, Irina's posted it in the question. So, um, Heather's going to post it in the chat to answer to it so that everybody will have be able to take a look at it. Okay. We have already get health status method in F. Do we need to update as we have already the get health method in the FDI package. Do we need to update as per the new specs? I'm going to start with this answer and hopefully um, somebody else can chime in. So um, what we've seen in a lot of the device packages is that the get health status method is supported so that you pass registration but the actual um you know the actual status codes you know are are are, are not displayed so in other words there was an, a a simple way to make people allow people to pass it um hi it's highly highly preferable that your dd support all of the traffic lights that that wally showed um, in the get health status method. So if you don't do that, then yes, you should um, be fixing this. And there aren't really new specs either. The specs, have, you know, the, 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 the requirement for the method has always been there. What we have done today is teach you a way to implement the spec without having the, um, the, Condensed status bit commands that Wally will know the 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 numbers of that were introduced in in Heart Seven, I think. So, Wally, can you add to that? Yeah, I think the simple answer is if you've got a good Get Health status method that really provides all the d directions and and pointers that the user wants, you're good to go. What we did with the samples is make it easy for everybody. If you've already done this manually on your own, you're good to go. But if you've just done some light way just to check a box, you really ought to do a better job. Yeah. Okay. Next question: What's the scope of improved Get Health implement status implementations for Profinet devices? Um, I can't really answer that one, but I think you should ask that question to uh, to to the PNO, um, and maybe they can provide a provide a similar webinar for Profinet devices. Um, we do co-own the spec with them, but they own co-own the FDI specifications, but they are the you know ones that own the Profinet protocol. Okay. Um, okay. Why should EDD contain Get Health status? Heart devices already have extended device status, which contains this. Um, well, I think the, the real the real point here of this presentation is. There's a lot of devices that do not support the condensed status commands. So the uh, failure function check out of spec bits are not active in command 48. 
And so the reason I chose to use the Hard IP Developer Kit is that particular product, if you will, doesn't support those condensed status commands, so those bits are not there. And the reason, you know, I can't speak completely to the reason, but you know, the FDI and the integration group, and there's about a hundred of them, really wanted a standard place, no matter what the protocol is, to go and look up these status bits. And so, you know, you really should have this in there, especially if you don't support the condensed status commands. Now, if you support the condensed status commands, the method gets easier. Okay. But there's a lot of devices that don't support those commands yet. And so this is good stuff. Okay. So from, okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, okay. Here's the link. Please provide the link. Okay. We have done this. Um, can the failure mask be loaded from a heart device using command 523? And I think yes, the answer is probably I, yes, yes. Yeah, if you already have implemented condensed status commands, there are other samples in the FDI package IDE 1.5 that shows how to do the condensed status, the get health status method when you have imported those commands, and the life is easier. Uh, we chose this one because there's a lot more devices that that obviously don't do those commands yet. Okay. Um, are there any other are there any other questions? I don't see any that have not already been answered. Um, there was a question about Hard Five DDDs, um, and can they be registered? So the the, the the short answer is that you you can maintain or re-register an existing Hard Five EDD only registration. But if you're coming um, in with uh, uh, new registrations, those require devices and EDDs, a device and an EDD. So, um, so hopefully that answers the that answers the question. Yeah, for, for Heart Five devices, you can do a DD revision and add this, and it would be a great thing for you to do. But it'd be a DD revision only. You can't do a device revision. Not if you have right. a DD. If you have a DD already reg already registered. Yeah. Correct. Right. Yeah. Okay, um, let's see. Oh, here's a couple more. Okay, Chris, I think we just answered your question for the device with all devices. Okay, here's one. Greetings from India. For a device with all device diagnostics information classified into only two categories, group warnings or group errors, do we require to keep all type of classification of the health status, or can we just keep three statuses, healthy, maintenance required, and failure? I think you can do whatever you want, but you won't be in conformance with any 107. That would be my answer. <laughs> and, Wally? Say again, I'm sorry, I typed the answer to another question. The basic question is they already have a device, but instead of instead of things being categorized into five distinct categories, they're only using three. The device is good, it needs maintenance required, so green, yellow, or red. Well, I mean, if they don't have diagnostics to tell you you need to do a function check, then yeah, you can't implement the light. Um, right. I mean, it's going to depend on what status they have available as to how many of these how many of these conditions they can actually tell the user. I mean, some yep. devices can't tell the user that somebody's working on the device. Right. Okay, I think that answers the question. Yeah. And I would read the specifications and send us a support ticket if you have questions about the specs. Okay, so we've got about five minutes left for any additional questions. Um, if we do not have any questions, um, any further questions, please um, thank you again for attending. Um, if you do have a question, please put it into the uh, into the into the window. And there's one more. I see you one can more. also put together um, the uh, you can also file support tickets. Heather, were you about to say something? Yeah, there's one more question about attachments. Um, they say any limitations to documents attached to the package? Um, can they be edited? So first, no, you can't edit those documents once they're in the package. It's a read-only distribution for your users. 
And there are limitations as to what kinds of documents you can attach, uh, which I did touch on in this presentation. Um, if you want further information, I can contact you afterwards. Um, also read the specifications because it does list what uh, package types, or sorry, document types are allowed in your package. Okay, if there's nothing else, then I think we can um, say goodbye. Thank you very much for attending this. Um, as we mentioned, it will be recorded. It will be posted to our YouTube channel. Um, what is what was recorded, and it will be posted to our YouTube channel. And we will um, we will go forward from there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good day.